I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. Thanks again for listening. This is the final part of my 500th podcast celebration. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. I go in with great preparation, which allows me to be loose. But what kept you going when you thought of quitting? Because I had nothing to fall back on. I dropped out of school. My dad always used to say, have something to fall back on. If I had something to fall back on and and I kind of liked it, I might have fallen back on it. It's true. So you have to be aware of some internal trigger like, oh, this doesn't feel good anymore. Right. Right. And then to remind myself, is this really how you want to spend your life? And the question I always ask myself, like my mom was 51 when she passed away. I think, well, that's not that far into the future for me anymore. So I'm turning 51 in... Uh, 13 days. So, right. Don't scare me. Well, and so for me, I just remember, okay, how do I, you know, is that how I would have wanted to have spent my time? Not really. And so to just keep that bigger thing in mind. It was uh, quite an interesting time. You know, my mother had me, she got pregnant with me when she was 16. And she had me 17 days after her 17th birthday. So on paper, Uh, I didn't look like a very good bet. You know, a a little black baby born to a 17-year-old black teenage girl in 1961 in Detroit, Michigan, you probably wouldn't bet on that baby too heavily. And that's one of the remarkable things about this country is when you look at where someone starts with such humble beginnings and uh, how it changes along the way if you work hard and have faith. And I had an epiphany. And I remember the hair just went up on my arms. And I said, this is what I'm going to spend the rest of my life doing. When I started interviewing people in late 2013, I would never have thought I would have done 500 podcasts. This is almost the longest straight activity that I've done in my life. And the reason I'm doing it is because I've just learned so many things. There's so much wisdom I've gotten from so many smart people. And I'm excited with this celebration. A, it's 500. So hopefully we'll make it to a thousand. But B, the past 100 episodes are just, these guests have just been incredible. I've been so happy with them. And I feel like I'm hopefully getting better as an interviewer. I'm learning every time. And so here's some more clips. Brad Meltzer is one of my favorite thriller writers, also a children's book writer, a comic book writer, and he's got a great TED Talk on 
imagining what your obituary is going to say. And so that's what we talked about in this particular podcast. When you imagine what your obituary is going to say, it puts everything in perspective. Life is short. And that's a cliche to say, but if you really live your life that way, you have to say, if this is the way I'm living my life, is my obituary going to be something that I would have been proud of? So anyway, Brad explains this better than me. Here's Brad Meltzer from episode 438. That's the thing is we, we, we love to think that history, and we teach our history sadly as, as if it's a bunch of dates and facts you have to memorize. That's not what history is at all. History is a selection process, and it chooses every single one of us every single day. And the only question is, do you hear the call? The call is there. What do you do with it? What do you mean? I feel feel like you're communicating a deep thought here. No, (laughs) it is a deep thought. I mean, right every day you can go out and be a better person and you can make history. What do you have to do to make history? Help one person. Be kind to one person. That's all history is. History is not something that just goes backwards and that we look back. Everything that hasn't happened is is history that's waiting to be written. Well, this and this segues a little bit into your your TED Talk, How to Write Your Own Obituary. And I want to get back to the first conspiracy, but maybe how did that... TED Talk come yeah, about? Yeah, um, this was early on in the TED days, um, and it was one they were doing in Miami, and um, the, it came about because I had worked to save the house where Superman was created. I went to, I was researching a book, and I went to see where Superman was created in Cleveland, Ohio. I wanted to see the place. I was like, show me the place. I want to see his bedroom, like where it was dreamed up, Jerry Siegel's hometown, and Joe Schuster, the artist, lived around the corner. I'm like, these 17-year-old boys gave us Superman. I want to see the house. And when I got there, the house was devastated. It was totally wrecked. And I said, I want to help save it. And we got together with a bunch of people, um, everyone from David Letterman and Stephen Colbert and Jim Lee and Joe Casada, like Marvel and DC, they all, we, everyone pitched in stuff. And we raised the money, saved the house. A reporter for the Wall Street Journal was interviewing me about it. He said, you know, Brad, this thing you did with the Superman house, it's going to be in your obituary. And my first thought was, thanks for so clearly contemplating my death, Right. But I was struck by that question. What are they going to say about me? What am I going to be? And a year went by and I couldn't shake it. And same thing with, with First Conspiracy. Like when years go by and I'm still thinking of an idea, I know write the book. I know do the story if I can't shake it for long. Mm. And I went back a year later to the Wall Street Journal reporter and I said to him, I need to ask you a favor. Um, can, I, want you to, I want to hire you to write my obituary. And he wrote it. And, he, you know, and I was reading through it. It said, you know, Brad Meltzer, a versatile Brooklyn-born novelist, spun a childhood passion for comic books and a prosecutor's zeal for research into a string of best-selling thrillers, died yesterday at his home. He was 40-something years old, whatever it said. I was such a narcissist. I think I'm going to try this. This is a, good, I, I, this is a fun I, idea. So you better credit me. So <laughs> the- uh, <laughs> I will. And so- You've heard it here. The, so what happens is, and the thing is, don't, oh, you'll see why you can't write it yourself. You have to let someone else write it. You don't get to write your own obituary. You can try, but they will not publish it. You have no guarantees. Um, and that is, I said, I was such a narcissist wanting to read my accolades and what I accomplished that I didn't read the body of his email. I just read the attachment. And in the body of the email, what it said was, hey, Brad, I got called on to another story, so I never got to finish your obituary. And as I'm reading through my own obituary, my obituary ends mid-sentence with these three words. He was a, and it just ends. That's it. And I'm like, wait, he was a what? What was I? Was I good? Was I bad? Did I matter? Did I achieve greatness? What was I? And I know there are so many people, and I know, James, I can see it on your face. You're doing, asking yourself right now, what are you, right? And that is what my talk is about, is what are you? And together, when you watch the talk, put in the word Brad Meltzer obituary, you'll find it immediately, um, is to answer the question, like what is our, and it really becomes not just what your what your obituary says, but it's what your legacy is. Because I realized, you know, there's the things you do for yourself and those things you do for other people, right? And and you got to separate those two things. You got What you do for yourself is, it will be in your obituary, where you went to school, what your job was, it'll be there. But those things you do, but, but when you die, it's one of the last times those things will ever be mentioned. Your job title fades with you. Your, your resume is gone. That's it. It fades over time. But those things for other, you do for other people, that's your legacy. Because that's what legacy is, right? It's what endures. It's what lasts. It's your impact on other people. So you got to separate, you know, if you figure out who's going to remember you, you'll figure out how you'll be remembered. And those things you do for other people, that's going to be what your legacy really is. So do you find after that TED Talk, which was 
obviously very impactful on a lot of people. It was downloaded, I don't know, yeah, hundred thousand times. Amount of times. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did that change your life doing that TED talk? It did. It totally changed my life because I started giving the talk and I started doing it. I do, you know, I still do it for corporate events and things like that. It's become like a whole new thing with more research and more stuff in it. But you can't give that talk. And I would say probably a year went by and I saw the impact it was having where I stopped and having, there's a real big, I don't want to ruin it, but you'll see there's a call to action at the end for it. And I had to stop and say, wait, what am I, instead of just giving advice and saying, here's a better way to live, and then you should see it in the talk. But I had to ask myself the question, what am I going to do? What change am I going to make? And um, one of the things it says uh, for myself is I took this hard look at myself and I was writing thrillers at that point and I thought I was going to just write these thrillers forever. But what I realized is, is I realized what I wanted my legacy to be and it was about being a dad. And I, and that's where I said, you know what, I need to do something that's just for my kids. And that's where I started writing the I Am Kids book series. Mm. We did the Ordinary People Change the World series. We started with I Am Amelia Earhart and I Am Abraham Lincoln. We did I Am Rosa Parks and Albert Einstein. I Am Jackie Robinson. Um, we've done Dr. King and George Washington and Gandhi. And we just came out with Neil Armstrong. And next month we come out with I Am Billie Jean King. It's I think our 17th book. And all of that came out of this talk of me taking a hard look at myself and saying, you know, there's all these things I want to do, but where, what do I really want to leave behind? How do I put good into the world? When I was five years old, Jim Henson taught me and, and Mr. Rogers taught me on Sesame Street and on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood that I could, you could use your creativity to put good into the world. And to this day, that's all I'm trying to do is use my own creativity to put good into the world. You ever deal with people who whenever you are around them, you just feel bad about yourself. Like maybe they put you down or maybe they question everything you do, or maybe they, they're passive aggressive and make you question some of your decisions without really being direct with you. Or maybe they manipulate you or kind of manipulate you into doing things that you're not so happy doing. I don't know. There's many ways that someone can be toxic. So I wanted to have a podcast about how to identify a toxic person. What is a toxic person? What should you do about them? So my friend, Amy Morin, who's been on the podcast six times, she's the author of 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do, which is, was a massive bestseller. Uh, in this clip, you'll hear us talk about how we deal with toxic people. Yeah, I, I used to have um, a boss who... Uh, I was fine working for him when I didn't have to deal with him. I would just do my job. And then every now and then he would invite me to dinner and I would always, I couldn't even figure out why. I always felt bad about myself <laughs> after the dinner and I never really figured out why. I mean, eventually I figured it out, but I would just notice I'm always feeling bad around when I'm around this person for a long time. And so I started to, my technique for dealing with, toxic people is to just simply cut them out of my life completely. Um, and they could write and call and whatever. And I just, they're, they're out. Um, you, you're, you were a little more gentle in your seven ways to deal with toxic people. Like what are some of your ideas for dealing with toxic people? And by the way, this could be a boss. This could be a relationship. There are some situations, this could be a friendship. Some situations you have to deal with a person like a boss. Some situations you can distance yourself, uh, like a friendship some situations you could temporarily distance yourself, like take a break, like a family member or someone like that. But what are what are some of the, the ideas? So, you know, one, like if it's somebody, let's say it's your mother-in-law who happens to be this person, and then you think, well, if you were to cut your mother-in-law out of your life, it'd cause relationship problems. So, so you don't want to do that. But at the same time, you don't want to have this person taking a toll on your life. So then it's about saying, okay, you can't set a physical boundary necessarily, but you set an emotional one. So... When we run into these toxic people, sometimes we complain about them, right? You dread seeing them, so you spend four hours dreading that you have to see them. And then after you saw them, you spend four more hours thinking you wish you hadn't seen them. And Are you describing your the past four hours before arriving at this podcast? <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> but you know when you—I've uh, done it before. When I'm doing something I don't want to do it, I could easily waste the whole day. So a one-hour— 
meeting or appointment with somebody, uh, who's, you know, waste four hours thinking how I don't want to go. And then afterward, rather than just move on with the day, it's easy to complain about it, to call somebody and vent, or to just sit and think, gosh, that was terrible, horrible, and awful, and that person shouldn't say those things or should be different. And then suddenly that one hour is taking up eight or nine hours of your day, and you're giving that person so much more room in your life. So, mm. and we think venting helps or complaining somehow gets it out or makes you feel better it doesn't and you really think about it the more you talk about people you don't like you might get a moment of pleasure and the other person agrees with you or something by the way this is an important point it used to be considered quite common and healthy even in psycho psychological literature that venting worked but right. it, but all the research shows that venting just does not work Right. And like, I think you mentioned it in this book. Yes, because it's one of those things. Everybody come into my therapy office and say, I have to get it out, as if getting it out somehow meant it wouldn't then bother you. But the more you talk about it with other people, you call a friend and you complain about somebody, you hang up the phone, you call the next person and you tell them the same story. That's just more time and space and energy that they're taking up in your life. So don't do that. So what if, so, okay, so what should you do? So you, you're, you're going to visit your mother-in-law in four hours. What, what should you, and you're dreading it. What should you do? So that would be where we say, change the channel, come up with something else to think about. And it might be that you have to physically get up and go do something different to get your mind off of it. But you have to make the conscious decision. I'm not going to spend the next four hours allowing this person to occupy my brain. But it's really hard because it's it's an addiction. Yes. Like sometimes we get addicted to, and you have it as another chapter, overthinking, but we get addicted to thinking, well, she's going to say this again, and then I'm going to say this, and then she's going to say this, but I've got this prepared, and I can't believe I let her say this last time. And, you know, we, we get addicted to these mental conversations. Uh, you have case studies in here. People just stay up all night, like, arguing in their head. Right. And uh, 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 how do you how do you get over that addiction? Because one thing about an addiction is it feels good. It sometimes feels good to have these imaginary arguments because that's where you get to win. Right, right. <laughs> and we fantasize about, yes, how it's going to end up this time and why I told them this time and that really helped. But I think it's about just recognizing, okay, I'm, I'm putting this much brain power into this person and they're taking up X amount of hours of my day. So just try to do something different. I'm going to go talk to somebody about a completely different subject. I'm going to get up and go run an errand. I'm going to do something in my house. I'm going to um, just stay busy for a few minutes and just see how it feels. Try it. Even if you think that's not going to work for you, do it as an experiment for a week and just see what happens. If your mood gets better, if you start to feel better, you start to think differently. But And you have more time and energy to devote to other stuff. What about, I'll call this past toxic syndrome. What about if you you have been visiting your mother-in-law every month for the past 12 months and you never really stood up for yourself you're miserable about it and now your arguments in your head are not about the future but about like why did i let her say this to me or why didn't i just respond with common sense on this one like and so now you're addicted to like these past <laughs> you're addicted to being angry at yourself even angry right. at her and yourself for not reacting differently is, that's a slightly different issue, but I guess the same kind of solution, I don't know. Right, so then I think maybe you, when you're rehashing that stuff rather than just keep replaying it or imagining yourself doing everything differently or all the things you should have said, just see what did I learn from it and then what can I do differently next time and to try to just apply it going forward. It's almost harder to do that because you think you because then you actually are aware of the wasted time and, and the bad decisions that you made that might have even affected other people in your in your life. And so there's, there's, there's not only anger, but maybe a little regret or shame or whatever. So you have to kind of put this technique in overdrive, which, which makes it harder. Right, because I think it's sort of like if you, you start a business and you think, I already put this much money in, I don't want to quit now. Even if it's failing, you want to keep going. I think it's a similar thing that we, we think, okay, I've invested this much into thinking about this toxic person. I don't want to quit now. <laughs> almost as if somehow by continuing it, you're going to make it better or change it. It's almost, it's similar to the advice on um, doing too much comparison thinking. So right. instead of taking a negative reaction, whatever that negative reaction might be, try to figure... Uh, okay, all I have is today and hopefully going forward. So what can I, it's too bad what happened or or it's too bad I'm comparing and then I've done this for too long, but what can I, how can I change the focus to learning so I could just 
simply improve myself. And, and improving myself has nothing to really do with the other people. Just right. just because I have to make the actions to improve myself. But what can I learn from these past mistakes? What can I not do? Or what can I learn from this person or whatever? Right. And when we look at a conversation, say that happened last month, and you're thinking of all the things you should have said, we've well, had 30 days to think about it. And then you blame yourself for not coming up with that witty remark in that moment. But you did the best you could with what you had and moving forward to do things differently. But we have this sort of hindsight bias of thinking, oh, I should have known or I should have done something differently. But you've had all this time to think about it now. So you have to be aware of some internal trigger like, oh, this doesn't feel good anymore. Right. Right. And then to remind myself, is this really how you want to spend your life? And the question I always ask myself, like my mom was 51 when she passed away. I think, well, that's not that far into the future for me anymore. So I'm turning I 51 in uh, 13 days. So, <laughs> right. Don't scare me. Well, and so for me, I just remember, okay, how do I, you know, is that how I would have wanted to have spent my time? Not really. <laughs> and so to just keep that bigger thing in mind of, you know, it would, would be great when I'm, hopefully I live to be a hundred and I look back over my life and is that how I would have wanted to spend it? No. So I just purposely build in more stuff with friends and family and having fun. Since I started the podcast, I wanted this guy to come on the show. And finally he came on. Jeff Garland stars in my all-time favorite show, Curb Your Enthusiasm, which is the show starring Larry David. Jeff Garland plays Jeff Green, who's Larry David's agent. He's also been doing stand-up comedy for 37 years. And he has a few simple rules for success. Follow your gut and don't have a backup plan, which is actually very similar to uh, one of my earlier podcasts with Jim Norton, who also mentioned, never give yourself a backup plan. It's very interesting to hear Jeff talk about this. He talks about these ideas in this clip from episode 460. You know, if I want to improvise in a scene on the Goldbergs, I have to tell them ahead of time. I'm going to improvise here, which is, and I have to tell the other actors because they don't know what to do. They get lost. Do you get it? Do you get a sense then, like, hey, I've been doing c comedy and humor uh, for 35 years. I'm a producer on the one of the best shows ever. Maybe my no. directions are no, are good. no, no, because that would be ego. Okay, and I recognize that, mm. and I don't go down that path. I'm. Whoever I'm working with, I know what I know, you know what you know, and we're all good. I never think that. I never would say that. Um, I do know what I'm – and by the way, there comes a point early on when I'm filming a movie or a show where I'm like, okay, this is not going to be creative, and I'm going to do the best I can, but I know that. So every day I'm not reminding people, you know, okay, I did this one movie. I forgot the name of it with uh, Gerard Butler and Jennifer Aniston. And uh, I, re uh, I remember, Steve, what was the name? Um, Bam Bam was the character in that other one. Oh, Bam Bam, <laughs> yes, on Curb. <laughs> but, anyhow, you, don't have to, you don't have to find the name of it. <laughs> I mean, I mean, we don't need to find it. Uh, it's not important. It. Point being is, I remember th uh, this, a scene I was doing, Sorry. The Bounty Hunter. I remember a scene I was shooting, uh, you know, uh, 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 and it was a, uh, and I improvised, only this much, and this is a st big studio film. And the um, director says to me, Jeff, this isn't Curb Your Enthusiasm. And I already knew it wasn't creative. This isn't Curb Your Enthusiasm. And I just replied, I know. <laughs> I know. So, okay. That's so the closest I've ever come to going, you know, I do this, you know, but I don't do that. So, I'm, so I'm humble whenever I work. Being confident and being humble together, a big bowl of delightful. Mm. You know, so you can't, that's why like generally when I go up and do stand-up, I have nothing prepared. I walk up to stage knowing nothing. Okay, hold on to that one. I will hold on to that. Because okay? I want to I get but to that. But that confidence and humbleness, I'm saying, leads me there. I'm completely confident that I'm funny and I know what I'm doing. Like even when I improvise, as opposed to saying to someone, I don't have to say it. I know I got that, you know. It's all a gut thing, man. Like if you feel like, like oh, I'm laughing, like this is funny. Yeah. Well, no, then I know it's working, yeah. but there's a feeling where you're like, we got it. You know, when I direct a movie, generally I'm done by lunch or a little after lunch because I don't doubt myself. 
And if I have it, I don't need to shoot more. And the only time I shoot inserts, you know, of little things like if we're talking that we need someone, my AD will say, we need an insert of the bottle. I go, you shoot it. Go ahead. Yeah. I don't want to even deal with that because that's just, you know. And every once in a while I need it. But I don't, I don't use the things that other people might think they need or be insecure about it. Well, what, what do you think directors go in thinking that they need? Well, no, director, like I'm the kind of director that when I'm directing something or producing something, I'm editing it in my head. So when I've gotten to the point of, I got it, we're good, um, I, I believe that, you know. I think other direct, and, and, and by the way, when I'm directing, I got a shot list. Um, sometimes uh, I had a difficult scene in this movie I did dealing with idiots, dealing with idiots about Little League Baseball parents where I actually storyboarded a scene. So I go in with great preparation, which allows me to be loose. It's like when I did stand up on Letterman. I would work that set. I would drive around New York and do it 10 times. So when I get there, I'm not thinking about it. It's freedom. The best way to be an actor is to know your line so well that you're, if you're doing a scene and you're thinking about what you got to say, you're not as good as you can be. Hmm. So you want to be as good and loose as you can be. So, so preparation is the key. What is that craft? Like what? I can't explain it. I, here's the thing for me with comedy, I don't analyze it. You know what I mean? I know things, like I said, about the actor not trying to put a spin on it. That's about as far as I want to deep. So you're looking for, like, real answers. Like, when I say real answers, not me avoiding, but I don't know the answer. I once went out. There was a guy who ran a gig in L.A., and I went out for coffee with him after. And he asked me questions like you're asking, and I went deep into all of it, I wasn't funny for the next two weeks. It's true. <laughs> and I remember actually Jerry Seinfeld's involved in this because he uh, put this book out uh, written by this comedian called Letters from a Nut and More Letters from a oh, Nut. Oh, yeah, I read And I picked them up. They were hilarious, and I got my comedy back. So I don't like deeply analyzing. I don't. I just know things inherently, and that's what I go with. I don't, I don't ask why. That's the point. The point is if – if you inherently know that you have it, don't let anyone stop you. Adversity is your best friend. It makes you better as a person and as an artist. But what kept you going when you, had, when you thought of quitting? Because I had nothing to fall back on. I dropped out of school. My dad always used to say, have something to fall back on. If I had something to fall back on and, and I kind of liked it, I might have fallen back on it. It's true. This next clip is with John Maxwell, who's the author of Failing Forward, How Successful People Think, and many other books. This guy's the real deal. In fact, I think I really think he saved my life in 2001. I was going so broke. I was losing my home. I was depressed all the time. I was anxious all the time. And he had just come out with his book, Failing Forward. And I would just read this book every day. And I would think to myself, this is real. I could fail and move forward. It's possible. I, I didn't think it was possible before I read this book. I didn't know. So I, again, John Maxwell, I can't even believe he came on my podcast after I've been reading his books for over 20 years. In this clip, he talks about what people really want from leaders, which is so important for everyone to know, whether you're a business owner, manager, a parent, a friend to someone, or even an employee. Like you, sometimes I always refer to this as you know, it's good to be an entreployee. So be a leader who's an employee. And we all lead and we all follow at different times of our lives and in different areas of our lives. So let's hear this clip. Let's hear what John Maxwell has to say to help us all be better leaders. I used to think, like most people, <laughs> I used to think I was a very good judge of people. Now I think I'm not such a good judge of people. Like, how would you no kind of when meeting someone oh i don't know if this is the person i want in my inner circle or not when i spoke a few years ago to the united nations i did the opening session of the united nations two hours to all the ambassadors wow. and of course we're dealing with different cultures i mean what can i say about leadership that will connect with everybody and so for two hours i i, I shared with them that there are three questions that followers ask of their leader doesn't matter what your culture is, doesn't matter what 
uh, age of life does not it, three questions that you go anywhere a follower is asking of their leader and the question number one is do you like me it just is very has nothing to do with your leadership do, do you like me do you care for me the second question is can you help me and the third question can i trust you now isn't it interesting two of those three questions about leadership have nothing to do with my competence as a leader. It have everything to do with do I care for you and am I a person of good character? And what, as I taught for two hours, I said basically the first thing I've got to do as a leader is I've got to establish myself as a friend and I've got to establish myself as a trustworthy friend. Now, now that that is, now the question is how competent I am to take them further. And, of course, I write books to help people become more competent as leaders so they can take, take people on a further journey. But what I know is this. The average person out there, if they spend much time with you, they really know if you care for them or not. They, they, they really do know. And they, if, if, if you care for them, they move towards you. And if you just care about yourself and, 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 and you're a, a leader that basically uses people, they move away from you. And, and I, I, just call, I, just, I call that just the intuitive drawing of people. They intuitively draw themselves to people that care for them, mm-hmm. and they intuitively back up. They may, not even, they may not even know the questions, but they know the sense and the feeling that I want to be with them or, you know what, I don't want to be with them very much. But I think I think that's a discipline too, in that sometimes we are attracted to the people who might be toxic in our lives. Um, you know, we 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 want somebody to like us who doesn't like us, so we try <laughs> extra hard to get them to like us. And I think it's a training to kind of not have that mindset. Well, I think it is too. But I I think I think naturally, intuitively, most of the time, people who really care for us, we know who they are, and. Uh, I even think people in dysfunctional relationships, even though they're in them and sometimes are seem to be caught in them and can't get out of them, I think they know and long for somebody who loves them unconditionally, somebody that truly values them, somebody that truly believes in them. And I think this is where a leader begins. I think a leader begins by, one, leading themselves correctly. Your leadership starts with me, not with others. And, and, and then, once I do that, making sure that, Every day, I just want to add value to people. And again, for 45 years, that's all I've done. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Main, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Main. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm trying... I had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half, and I just took Mizzen and Main clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Main. As you wrap up your year end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've got very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts are untucked shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at Mizzen and Main, M I Z Z E N and Main dot com. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. 
one that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. This next clip, it was insane. First off, this guy was telling so many crazy stories about his life. We were just riveted. And at the same time, we were late to catch an airplane. So I was kind of half panicking, but I didn't want to leave. We were in LA. We we stopped by Byron Allen's office. Uh, Byron Allen recently bought the Weather Channel for 300 million. But what many people don't know about him is when he was 15, he was a stand-up comedian. He was the youngest comedian ever to appear on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. And then after that, he was hired to write jokes for a famous comedian of the 70s uh, named J.J. Walker. His first day, he's like a teenager. He's like, right after high school, he goes over to where J.J. Walker and his team is writing jokes. And it's Byron Allen, David Letterman, and Jay Leno all writing jokes for J.J. Walker. Uh, And he's got just an incredible story of moving from being in the comedy business to basically being a businessman in show business. So he overcame incredible obstacles. His mom was just 17 when she had him. Uh, They moved to L.A., and from there, Byron found his way into the TV scene, the comedy scene, and like I mentioned before, he now owns the Weather Channel. I mean, almost every day I see he's buying something new. His story is incredible. This is a clip from episode 424. You know, I was uh, a kid from Detroit, Michigan, and born there in 61, and uh, in 68, uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated, and we uh, we had uh, really bad riots in Detroit. I was seven years old, and uh, the military came in and took over our neighborhood, and we were under military siege, and we were on lockdown. I mean, you know, within minutes of, of them assassinating Martin Luther King, I was looking down the barrel of the tank, mm. um, and troops were walking uh, all over our neighborhood and on our lawns with bayonets and you know, the dogs, and they were very clear, don't move or get in your house or we're going to kill you or we're going to shoot you on the spot. And definitely do not be on the streets after dark because that's just an automatic shoot and kill. So um, it was uh, extremely uh, tense uh, the summer of uh, 68. And uh, and uh, my mom said, let's go visit some, some friends and family in uh, Los Angeles. 
So we ended up going to LA and uh, for what was supposed to be a two week vacation. And uh, we ended up staying and that was 50 years ago. And when my mom and I came out here to LA, we really struggled quite a bit, you know, stayed uh, uh, on a lot of sofas and a lot of floors. And Did you have uh, family out here? Yeah, my, my grandfather's sisters. And uh, it was uh, quite an interesting time. You know, my mother had me, she got pregnant with me when she was 16. And she had me 17 days after her 17th birthday. So on paper, uh, I didn't look like a very good bet. You know, a, a little black baby born to a 17-year-old black teenage girl in 1961 in Detroit, Michigan, you probably wouldn't bet on that baby uh, uh, too heavily. And, uh, you know, that's what, uh, you know, is one of the, uh, one of the remarkable things about this country uh, is when you look at where someone starts with such humble beginnings and, and how it could not go very well. Uh, and, and, you know, and, uh, how it changes along the way if you work hard and have faith. Uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I don't know this, but where's your mom now? She's here. She's here. Uh, her office is right on the other side of this wall. Oh, you're kidding. Her first job here was with, you know, the Urban League, and they helped get the job at the Salvation Army. But she went on to get into UCLA, and she got a, ended up getting her master's degree in cinema TV production. And because she was at UCLA and she was working on her master's degree, um, she went out to the entertainment industry to get jobs. And she went to NBC and asked for a job, and they said no. And she said, uh, she asked, do you have an, an intern program? And they said no. And she asked a question, one of the most important questions that probably changed, um, well, it did change our life forever. She asked the question, will you start one with me? And they said yes. And so she got a job as an intern working for free at NBC. And because of that, she was able to get a job as a tour guide. And she then started getting giving tours of NBC. And, <clears throat> you know, I'm a, I'm a young kid at this point. And so uh, there's, you know, there's no such thing as child care or nannies. That's not something I discovered until my wife and I had three kids. Um, so I used to go, to go to NBC with my mother after school and during the summer. Um, and I discovered a whole nother world, uh, very different from the world that I was exposed to uh, with my dad working at Ford and my granddaddy working at Great Lake Steel, which is an amazing world. And I couldn't wait to put on a uniform and go make cars for the world or steel for the world. Uh, it was a different kind of factory. This NBC that I had discovered was a content factory. And I was a kid in, in a wonderland. I, uh, I literally just hung out in the studios all day. And I would watch Johnny Carson do the Tonight Show, and then I walk across the hall and watch Sanford, watch Red Fox do Sanford and Son, and then I would go down the hall and watch Flip Wilson do his variety show, and then I go and watch Bob Hope do his specials, and I would watch Freddie Prince do Cheek on the Man, and I would just go from studio to studio. I was watching them do Days of Our Lives, and I watch. I go to the local little news studio and I watch an unknown sportscaster. Uh, do the sports, Brian Gumble, before he got the Today Show. And I watched the weatherman, unknown weatherman, do the weather before he got, you know, Pat Sajak, before he got Will of Fortune. And I'm just watching, and I'm watching the camera crew work with the director, work with the lighting director, work with the, the grips, the, the writers, the producers, work with the executives and the negotiations. And I'm just a kid, and I'm wallpaper, and I'm just standing, and I'm watching the process. And I'm watching them make talk shows and sitcoms and game shows and soap operas and 24-hour and, and newscasts. And I'm watching 24-hour news operations. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. What a wonderful way to go through life, entertaining people, informing people, and making people laugh. And I had an epiphany. And I remember the hair just went up on my arms. And I said, this is what I'm going to spend the rest of my life doing. And I don't care if I ever get paid one penny. Mm -hmm. I will do it for free. And I will sleep outside. And I will eat grass. But I will do this for with my life. This how, is what how I'm old were you then? I was probably 12 years old. You know, it, it's, it's interesting how many people who are, 
the be- the peak of their profession got their first sense of immersion in that profession as a kid. So you look at like, I don't know, so many different industries, but you know, Richard Branson, obviously with music as a kid, uh, I, I'm even, I'm thinking back to various podcast, podcast guests we've had, like Gary Kasparov and Ch- chess as a kid, Tony Hawk in this area was skateboarding as a kid. Um, and I always wonder, do you think you could have achieved or caught up somehow if you, if, if these things interested you later in life than when you were 12? Sure. I, 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 at 12, though, you're built, your neurons are just wiring, so you, you became entertainment at the age of 12. Like, your brain was wired for it. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, I, I loved, you know, just seeing how it worked. You know, people always try, I can't wait to get to the top. Ah, who cares about being at the top? It's the journey. I mean, you know, one, some of my greatest moments, not buying the Weather Channel. I mean, that's a great moment. You know, that's history. I'm the third owner of the Weather Channel, right? Uh, but I wouldn't trade being in a room, being in Jimmy Walker's living room with David Letterman and Jay Leno and Marty Nadler and Wayne Klein and learning how to write comedy, which is one of the greatest gifts ever. That was just a remarkable time for a 14-year-old kid. And I'll never forget, um, one day at, after the meeting, uh, Jimmy handed me an envelope. And I had no clue what it was. And I opened it up and it was a check. It was a check for $25. And I said, what is this for? He says, well, I bought one of your jokes. Jay and Dave were getting $200 a week. Hmm. They were on staff. That's what they got paid, 200 a week. I didn't make staff. I got $25 a joke. And... I asked Jimmy, I said, can I get on staff? He goes, no, 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 no. He goes, you don't need to be on staff. Those guys have, it, 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 you know, they got to pay their bills and blah, blah, blah. He goes, but you can make more than them. Just sell me 10 jokes a week. <laughs> I never sold them 10 jokes in a week, but I sure did try. <laughs> so he was paying me 200, he was paying me 25 bucks a joke. And at the time, James, I was, I was a paper boy and I was throwing the Herald Examiner and I was getting paid half a penny a paper for every paper I delivered. I had to throw two newspapers to make one penny. Hmm. I had so to be like 5,000 papers to make to, 25 bucks. It was like 5,000, 50,000 papers or whatever <laughs> yeah. it was to make 25 bucks. So when he handed me this check for 25 bucks, I had never seen a check made out to me before. And I was like, what is it? I t- went to my mother, I go, what is this? She goes, it's a check for 25 bucks. And I said, what's gonna happen now? She said, you're going to take it to a bank and you're going to cash it and they're going to give you $25 cash. And I said, then what happens to the check? She says, they're going to send it back to Jimmy. I said, I don't want to cash it. I want to keep it. I cannot believe somebody paid me for a thought that I had in my head. She says, well, you can cash it and then ask Jimmy to give you the check. I go, is that right? She goes, that's right. So I go, I open a bank account at uh, Bank of America on La Brea and uh, Wilshire. And I walk in and I open an account and I say, I'm here to open an account and uh, I need to deposit $25. <laughs> so I open the account, they send the check to Jimmy. It was He was at Crocker Bank, I remember it. And uh, I have a copy of the check, I'll show it to you. And uh, I said, I'd like to get the check back, if I could, please. And he said, okay. And like a month later, he gave me the check and I framed it, and it's always with me. I have it somewhere right over here, uh, and that was it. And I could not believe somebody gave me twenty. And I called the next day after I got the cash, and I quit my paper out. I I called my supervisor and said, "Look, I don't know how to break this to you, but uh, I'm very very rich now, <laughs> and I need to uh, I need to uh, give up my route, and uh, you need to find somebody else to deliver these papers." And it was the worst route I had little old ladies that were complaining. I didn't get it on the porch. I got it on the step. And, and you'd have dog- to collect, right? Oh yeah, I had to collect. I had dogs chasing me. It was like, it was, it was not one of the, I, the highlights of my, of my I, life. I was a paper boy <laughs> as a kid, but it was, uh, it, it, it wasn't as hard to collect probably in my neighborhood as your neighborhood. <laughs> oh yeah, I had to collect. It was not easy. And, and just, I, the collection, I didn't, didn't bother me as much as, I cannot believe I got three calls to my supervisor because I had to, I, I, they were very, my, they were like, you have to get it on the porch, not the step. 
I yeah. mean, I had there were people. I had to get off my bike, put down my kickstand, yeah. get the paper, walk over to the porch, put it on the porch, and then get back on my bike and get away from their pit bull. It was just not fun. Yeah. But anyway, I was really happy. We quit. I, I was. I let that job go and moved on to the next phase of my career and became a full time comedian and comedy writer. <laughs> I couldn't believe that Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, I mean, this guy built up Google from nothing to a trillion dollars in value, and he was coming on my podcast. So this clip is all about how he found success by trusting a coach to help him. Now, what does a coach tell the CEO of Google, the most maybe the most powerful company in the world? I wanted to know. And it was, again, funny. I asked him specifically, is there a secret hotline for billionaires? I'm constantly obsessed with this question. Let's hear his clip and what he learned from his coach, Bill Campbell. Here it is. Here's Eric Schmidt. What do you think is the difference between coaching and mentoring? Well, a lot of people are confused about this because everybody wants a mentor. You want somebody to complain to, you want to support you, to feel better. We need this. That's not what a coach is. A coach is somebody who is helping the team win. And what's interesting about it, in my case, when I had a coach, I thought he was coaching me as an individual. In researching this book, I realized that he had been coaching the company and the whole team the whole time. Right? His interactions with me were so personal that I felt he was an individual coach. But what he was really doing was making sure we were all fighting for the same principle for the institution that we're part of. And that was what he did as a coach. And no business today has a coach like that. And it's a terrible omission. You know, and, and I, he has so many interesting principles and stories that you talk about throughout the book. But I want to kind of at least demonstrate some of them first through example, the first example being you. So uh, first, but by way of background, you know, you were, you were CEO of Novell, you, you had a, a huge uh, career in the tech industry, and Google was a relatively small but fast-growing company in 2001. And, you know, Larry Page, Sergey Brin, they they felt the need, I guess, or they were being encouraged to bring on a uh, more mature CEO to help them through the IPO process and through the growth process and so on. Do you think, A, they resented that, and B, what was maybe kind of any initial concerns when you all three started working together, when you became the CEO and you started working together? And this will lead to, to Bill's involvement with you staying at Google. So Larry and Sergey had taken money from the venture capitalists, as one does, and part of the deal was that they had to bring in somebody who had some operating experience. So Larry and Sergey, being clever and unusual, decided to test every one of them out. So they would typically go on a weekend vacation with every candidate, which usually would not end well. <laughs> they, like, like when did it not end well? Well, let's just say they did not have compatible views. Uh, can, can, yeah, you can't, you can't leave me with that. <laughs> <laughs> What's an example? Um, it's better not to name names, but let's just say that the culture of tech, tech is different and you need people who can operate the way they operate, which is largely technical with a technical background and a lot of experience. And I had that. Do you think Steve Jobs made the mistake of you know, not bringing someone from a technology background when he brought in John Scully as CEO? Well, it's interesting that, that I don't know that, but what I do know is that when I joined Google, um, I wanted to avoid the John Scully, Steve Jobs mistake. For those of you who don't know, what happened was that after the first stint, it was agreed that they should bring in a professional executive because Steve was pretty crazy in, a, in, a crazy in an entrepreneurial way. So they brought in a very seasoned executive named John Scully. The two had a fight, and John went to the board and said, pick Steve or pick me. And the board picked the CEO whom they had just hired, and Steve lost his job of his company. Four years later, of course, John was out, another set of CEOs went in and out, and then Steve came back. And I knew right up front that it was important to avoid that fate. So I set out to work with Larry and Sergey, who I admired and enjoyed a great deal, but it, it's, I understood it was their company, and I was there to help. And that's how we got it. You know. well, well, and I don't know if 
Bill learned this from you or vice versa, but uh, in the book you mentioned when um, you know there was a new chairman of Twitter, he, or no, when, he, when there was a new CEO of Twitter, Dick Costello, uh, he gave the advice that, listen, the founders are always the founders. You're the CEO right now. So make sure you know you get along. You 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 work with the founder as well, and I think that avoids the whole. I think Bill and I just sort of agreed on that. I think neither of us learned that from the other. It was obvious, given what had happened with Scully, uh, that it was important to respect the founders. And indeed, if you look at the most successful technology companies today, the founder has been incredibly involved in their success. And the reason is that the founders can do things that no one else. They have both the intellectual power, the emotional power, and in some cases, the ownership to actually force change at a time of great challenge in a corporation. Uh, we're, we collectively, and I in particular, am very much supporter of founder-led companies. So, so I was there to help. Right. So from 2001 to 2004, was this, were, these were these pre-IPO years. So also there was an internet bust going on for, for the first part of that, where you arrive at Google, operationally, you're, you're gearing the company up for huge growth, which maybe they could have done, maybe they couldn't have, or maybe they weren't interested in doing. Were there any... It, it was before. This was sort of a pre-Bill time for you at Google. Well, what, actually, actually, Bill came in in the first in the at the end of two thousand one. So he was there part of the pre-IPO period as well. And the story there is actually sort of um, shows you how sort of foolish I was. John Doerr, who had recruited me to the company, remember I'm aware of my need to work well with Larry and Sergey, calls and says, "You need a coach." And I said, "I don't need a coach." Look at all the things I've done. Look how good I am. You know, compared to everyone else, I mean, come on, you just hired me. I'm like super good. <laughs> right? And I more or less said it like that. In the pretty arrogant. Maybe like super arrogant. And and John listened to me and then he said, um, do tennis players have coaches? Hmm. He had gotten me with that question. And of course, tennis players have coaches. And I pointed out that the coaches were not as good as the tennis players. And John said, that's the point, right? A coach does something different. Hmm. So based on that, uh, we started with Bill, who I knew well socially from because the Valley is small. And he was immediately correct. And so he started off working with our product marketing function, which consisted of three product managers, right, who are Susan Wojcicki, Marissa Mayer and Salar Kemengar, who went on to have enormously successful careers in building out product management and then sales and working with our board. And so uh, during this time, so, so in 2004, I guess, with, with, with the IPO happening, there was this critical coaching that Bill did with you that, that kept you at the company. And we'll get to that in a second. But before then, were there any moments, again, it's you coming in to this culture, to what Larry and Sergey had built, were there any moments of, of tension or even small problems that needed to be worked out where Bill was critical at kind of seeing uh, the gaps between, in communication between the three of you? And you refer to uh, that he was so good at understanding these small gaps in communication later on. I'm just curious where it might have happened with you personally. Um, well, it happened all the time in that he would meet with everybody. Um, we started not focused with Larry and Sergey because I was very focused on that relationship, but on the, getting the board set up. Because in these small dynamic companies, there's an awful lot going on. So his first duty was to do the board. And I said, well, Bill, why don't you get on the board? And he said, I would never want to be on the board. And I said, why? I mean, you know, it's a big, big deal to be on our board. And he said, it would prevent me from doing what I want to do. Very interesting. So, so he really understood that you know, and this is related to the compensation issue as well, that to avoid all, to really do the best job as a coach, which is what he was fundamentally interested in and what, what was providing meaning for him, it seems, in his life, as opposed to money or titles or, you know, being famous or whatever, to really do what he wanted to do, he needed no conflicts at all. He needed to be able to call you and tell you off without being worried Absolutely. about kicking, getting and, kicked and, off the board. And one of the things that he, that he, that he worked very hard on was trust. Um, one of our executives had gotten ill with a cancer that was similar to what Bill was facing, um, and Bill didn't tell me. And I remember being both annoyed that he didn't tell me I was the CEO, but also impressed that he could keep a secret. Right. So you judge people based on on trust pretty quickly, 
you know, can you trust somebody or not? And I quickly determined that I could trust him. And I think one of the things that's never talked about is that all of the people in these critical situations have all sorts of personal choices and ambiguities and so forth. And he got to the point where he was giving everyone advice, but his entire goal was to keep the team together, just like a football coach. Yeah, he, he, throughout the book, you focus on, and he focuses on the importance of the team. And not at the complete sacrifice of the individual, because I think he encouraged individual development. He encouraged managers themselves to be coaches to the people working for them so that the people working for them could live their best lives and have their best potential. But there was always this focus that the employ the member of a team needs to focus on the bigger vision while being optimal from an operational point so, of view. And, and one of the things that, again, I think this is true in general and in the industry that you're from as well, is that there are superstar people and they really are better th at what they're doing than other people. And you have to figure out what to keep them in the company employed and focused. Often these superstar people come with baggage, starting with arrogance like I exhibited or narcissism or self-doubt in strange ways. And so the coaching around superstars, which, and I think about, think about a football coach today with all these superstars, with all the money they have, or a basketball coach, you can see the metaphor, right? They actually need to understand what makes these people tick. So what I learned about Bill was that he would first ingratiate himself in the sense that he would tell you you were good at something. And then when you inevitably failed at it, he would say, you can do better. Now, why doesn't he say, you suck to start with. And the answer is he understood that the criticism wasn't to criticize you, but rather to have you criticize yourself. And you made yourself better. And that to me is the essence of coaching. David Rubenstein might possibly be the most powerful guy in the world. He's the co-chairman and co-founder of the Carlisle Group, which is the biggest private equity firm in the world. They own hundreds of companies, have over $200 billion in assets. He does so many things. He's all, he has a TV show on Bloomberg. He's the chairman of the JFK Center for the Performing Arts in the Smithsonian. He, he bought the Declaration of Independence and then immediately donated it to charity. His success could be intimidating, but he's just a laid back, relaxed guy. I felt so relaxed with him. He said to me, I'm 69. I didn't start Carlisle until I was 37. Maybe people find out what they love earlier, but I found out later in life. So that's encouraging. I'm 51, 37 is still seems young to me, but I'm inspired by him. And he walked me through all this. He told me how he stumbled into his new love for philanthropy, the careers he experimented with early on in his life, and how he learned to develop new skills at each different stage of his career, skills like motivation and persuasion. And believe me, he seemed like a shy, introverted guy, but... When he started describing his experiences, it's clear he he learned a lot of skills. So David says this is all part of his third life. That's what this clip is about, the importance of having a good second and third life. So you, you were around all of these incredibly charismatic people like Jimmy Carter, Nobody knew him when he started running. Everybody thought it was a joke. This go one-term governor from Georgia uh, running for president. Um, of course, Birch Bay uh, defeating an incumbent and, and staying in office for so long. You know, Washington is filled with probably more charisma than intelligence, some would say. You've seen all these charismatic people and, and you yourself, you built this huge firm. And, you know, you don't come across, I doubt you would describe yourself as the most charismatic person in the world, but you're certainly very charismatic. What, 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 what do you think are elements of, of charisma as you were building, you know, and raising tens of millions of dollars for the Kyle group, Carlisle group? Well, I wouldn't say I, I'm charismatic. I Some, knew you wouldn't say. I would say I'm char charisma challenged. Charisma <laughs> is a word that came into the American uh, popular um uh, a lexicon, I'd say, when John Kennedy became president. People saw a certain sex appeal, charisma, we called it, that just defied what you had seen with, let's say, Eisenhower or Harry Truman, for example. And charisma is something that politicians like to have. It's a, you know, I would say, a kind of sex appeal. You you can get people excited. You People listen to what, what you have to say. I don't have that kind of uh, personality. I wish I did. But these 
people who have those kind of personalities are often people who are student body presidents or uh, big men on campus. I was not, I was a little man on campus. Uh, in fact, in my graduating class, I would have been voted probably the least likely to succeed. I wound up being the chairman of the board of my alma mater, Duke University, and I would have been voted at the time there the least likely person to probably be chairman. And I tell people, uh, and particularly college audiences um, and, and, and so forth and students, the trick in life is not to win necessarily the first third of life, but to win the second and third third. If you win the first third of life and you are a Rhodes Scholar, you're president of the Harvard Law Review, you're Supreme Court clerk, you're student body president, people think you're great, and maybe you are, but then you can tend to coast on that. And if you coast on that, the second and third third, you'll be bypassed by people like me who have to struggle to get through the first third and they learn how to struggle. And then they, in the second and third third, they're struggling, teaches them how to succeed. So I like to remind people that winning the first third of life is nice, but not necessarily gonna indicate who's gonna be successful in the part of life that probably matters, the second and third third. Well, but it seems like you did pretty well or very well the first third, you know, went to good schools, ended up working in the White House. Uh, you know, you mentioned John F. Kennedy. You worked for a while for, for Ted Sorensen, his speechwriter, one of mm -hmm. the greatest speechwriters of all time. Uh, so from him, you must have learned a little bit about what makes, what makes someone a leader. Uh, where, where was your struggle in the first third? And, well, and, I, and without the self-deprecating like Carter yeah, and I, inflation. I, and, I would say, um, you know, I, my athletic career peaked at seven or eight. You know, when I was six, I thought like I'd be good a- Jews. Well, yeah, I thought I was six o'clock at six at six age at the age of six. I thought, okay, I could be a professional baseball player. My idol was Mickey Mantle, Willie Mays. Then at seven or eight, my you know, eight, my growth stunted, and at nine, I was short, and ten, I was too short. And then I realized, you know, if you're Jewish, you're not likely to be a major league baseball player unless you're Sandy Koufax and you're unusual. So I uh, wasn't a great athlete, and I, you know, I wasn't first in my class. I wasn't student body president. Um, I wouldn't say the most beautiful girls in the uh, city of Baltimore were flocking to uh, go out on dates with me. So I would say I wasn't uh, you know, a, a big success. Uh, I was a success only in the eyes of two people, my parents. I was their only child. So they thought I was successful, but I knew better. And, and, but, but then that, that's still not through the first third. That's like right. the first sixth. <laughs> then where would you say the struggle was after that? Like obviously you were, you were educationally uh, you, you, you succeeded at having a great education and I'm sure you, you, you did well everywhere. And then you had, you, you, you basically chose a path in life and, and seemed to keep succeeding well, at it. People did much better, but I'll give you an example. Uh, I got a job in the White House, which happened by working in the campaign. Uh, if you work in a campaign and it wins, you probably get a job in the White House. So I joined Jimmy Carter when he was 33 points ahead of uh, Gerald Ford in 1976, and Carter won by one point. You could argue my contribution wasn't so great, but I uh, was the deputy to the domestic policy advisor who knew Carter well, and I became uh, his deputy. Uh, and I worked very hard for four years. I did virtually nothing but work in the White House. I loved it. But then we lost the election. So all of a sudden, somebody who's flying around on Air Force One, going to Marine, or Marine One, going to Camp David, advising the President of the United States, is unemployable because nobody wanted to hire a young lawyer who really didn't know how to practice law uh, to do something in Washington, D.C. So it probably took six months before somebody would hire me. So I would say, you know, I had to lie to my mother. I said, I have so many offers, I don't know which one to take. And she would say, well, take one of them. It's, you know, it's May already, it's June. I mean, you know, everybody else is working. But so I would say that was a struggle. And then uh, when Were I you went- scared? I'm sorry? Were you scared at that point? I wasn't, I wouldn't say scared. I would say that I, was embarrassed that nobody probably wanted to hire me, even though I thought I'd gone to a good college and gone to law school and you know, I worked in the White House and I wasn't terrible, but I, I realized in hindsight that I had no legal skills anybody wanted because I didn't really practice law that long. And secondly, influence peddling, which is often done in Washington, is good if you are close to people in power. Well, Reagan wasn't somebody that I knew, so it didn't really work out. Um, in the end, perseverance, you know, worked. I mean, I just persevered. I just kept going forward and I got lucky. I practiced law again and that's the greatest thing that happened to me. When I, second time I practiced law, it was clear to me that I didn't really, I wasn't a really good lawyer. Lawyers are really have specialized in various things. They care about little details. They have a narrow area of expertise and they learned that in the first seven years out of law school or seven, eight years. Well, I was mostly in the White House then, so I didn't really have the legal skills that my peers had. But had I done so, I would have been a nice, Washington corporate lawyer. And by the time I was 65, I would have been eased out of my firm. 
because they retire you now. Uh, because I wasn't good at practicing law, I had to do something else. And I, I stumbled into private equity. I got in on the ground floor of an industry that was booming and I got very lucky and it, and it worked out. Uh, but it was, you know, some struggle to get there and it took a long time. And when we first started the firm, many people laughed at us because who's going to build a private equity firm in Washington, D.C.? It's a, it's a government city and and nobody took us seriously for, for many years. You know, I've heard you say, um, you know, the key to happiness is generosity. And you've also said in other speeches that um, chances are you won't be good at something you hate doing. You have to be That's good true. at something you, you love doing. I think a big struggle many people have, particularly in today's day and age where, where people don't stay at the same job for 50 years often, they either, they, they either reinvent themselves or someone gets divorced and moves and has to recreate themselves. How does someone find, whether they're young or middle-aged or older, how do they find what, what, what they love doing or what can make them happy? It's rare that somebody will, at a young age, say, this is what I want to do in life, and it works out. You know, maybe Willie Mays, Hank Aaron, Mickey Mantle, early on, knew they wanted to be a baseball player, and they wor it worked out for them, but that's rare. And, of course, if you are in that fortunate situation, you have to figure out what you do with the rest of your life when your playing career o uh, is over. But it takes a while to experiment. I, you know, thought I wanted to go in government. I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. I... I thought about politics. In the end, I found that what is making me happy is building something from scratch with the help of others, getting the material rewards from that, and then giving those material rewards to other people and helping other people. So that's what motivates me. Um, but everybody has their own motivation. But I, th I tell people, I've made two college grad commencement speeches just in the last couple of days, and I told the students at Indiana University and University of Baltimore, experiment. You won't know right away. Try different things. Your parents are wonderful, but ignore what they want. My mother wanted me to be a dentist, well-meaning, but I didn't really want to do that. You can't let your parents live your life for you. So f tried many different things. I didn't start Carlisle until I was 37. Um, you know, maybe people are, 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 can start things and find what they love earlier. I, I found out later in life. And now, because I found out later in life, and particularly now because I'm involved in my philanthropy phase, I am doing what I call sprinting to the finish line. I, I'm, I'm now 69 years old, the age that Ronald Reagan was when he ran against Carter. When I thought 69 was old, old age and you ready for a nursing home, now I think it's the prime of life. But I recognize that at 69, I've lived more than I'm going to live and probably have lived at least three quarters of my actuarial expected life. So I'm trying to get as many things done in the remaining 25% or whatever it might be because I don't want to be on my deathbed saying, oh, if I'd only done that, or why didn't I do that? I just don't want to do that. I want to get things done now, and that's why I'm, I, I'm working harder now and longer hours than I did when I was in my 20s. And so experimenting also, I think, like I know you're, you, you read a lot, you read over 100 books a year, you're involved in the, you, you sponsor the National Book Festival. Uh, reading is often a good way to safely experiment without actually leaving your, your room. <laughs> Um, when I was six years old, I got a, a library card at the Enoch Pratt Free Library in Baltimore, and it was a prized possession, and somebody actually recently gave me a copy of it. Uh, they, they had on the files, I guess. Um, and you could take out 12 books a week, and I would take out the 12 books, and I could I'd read them all in one day. I had to wait another week before I could take out more books. I, I thought they should have changed the policy, but I, I didn't know how to persuade people in those days. So I <laughs> couldn't do it. Um, reading has enabled me to go from a very cloistered uh, uh, you know, upbringing in Baltimore to a more worldly knowledge. And to me, it's, it's what really has helped me in life. So I think that reading books is better than reading tweets or other things because you, you concentrate the brain. You have to spend hours and hours and hours doing it. So I do love reading and I like to remind people, unfortunately, the 14% of Americans are functionally illiterate, so they can't read at all beyond a fourth grade level. And 30% of Americans are um, what I would call illiterate, which is to say they can read, but they choose not to. So 30%, and I say 30%, it's, it's 30 percent of Americans who graduate from college never read another book in their life. Mm. Hard to believe, but it's a sad situation. So I, I try to tell every graduating class or people I speak to, read books. Keep reading, reading, reading. It's this, it, it exposes you to so many different parts of the world, and, and it's a great pleasure in life. I'm all about finding ways to not take the classic route of success. In fact, nobody takes the classic route of success. Nobody goes from 
college to graduate school to startup to CEO and millionaire and billionaire and so on. That's very rare. And this next guy, uh, Jamie Metzl, the author of Hacking Darwin, Genetic Engineering and the Future of Humanity, definitely took a very alternative route. He, he a total choose yourself story. He was a science fiction writer and a really good one. Like I love his books. And then he just started teaching himself about genomics. He's not a doctor. He's not a PhD in, in biology. And he became the expert on genomics. He, he wrote a book on it, which is this Hacking Darwin. And it's so much better than all the books. I'm fascinated with this topic. It's so much better than all the books by scientists that I've read. And it's such an important topic. As he put it in the podcast, within the next 10 years, all 100% of healthcare is going to change because how fast genomics is is growing. So let's hear from Jamie how he carved out this path for himself. Here's the clip. And you know the, the funny thing is, so your book's all about uh, where we are right now and what the future is in uh, let's call it gene editing or in the future, gene writing, creating new genes, maybe even creating new forms of life, or maybe vastly changing our current lives by editing or rewriting some of our genes in many ways. Like, I'll just skip right to the future. Like, we could be smarter, taller, even more popular, <laughs> more social, less extroverted or introverted, uh, live longer, all these things could potentially happen. And, and, and in addition to where gene editing is right now, which is eradicating all these serious diseases and you kind of tell where the technology is, but, but how the potential is just amazing. But there's all, I sort of feel like the ethical questions like, Oh, can you, you know, harvest genes, uh, in this way for, is that ethical? Because you know, genes from embryos and then destroy the embryos. I feel like these type, types of ethical arguments are are pointless. Like if you could just help large numbers of people, like a billion people, then why, why do you care about an embryo? Yeah, and my feeling, I would agree from my personal view um, that if you're having to choose between um, uh, curing or preventing some deadly disease that a real existing person has. Like blindness. It's just all, or even just some, some of these diseases, which genetic diseases that can cause unbelievable pain to a little kid and then kill them. And if you are saying, well, that is what we're trying uh, to cure, and we think we can do it, but we need to use these early stage embryos just to see what is and isn't possible, it's my personal view that that ought to be highly regulated, but also allowed. But I recognize, and I think we have to recognize that just that there are different kinds of people and different people have different views. And because we're all one species, I think rather than dividing ourselves into an us and a them, I think we have to at least try to say, is there a path we can all get where we'd like to go and get there uh, and get there together. But there's there are trade-offs and some of these ethical issues, people like to live in worlds where it's totally clear, like this is totally right and this is totally wrong. But most of our lives exist in those gray areas in the middle. And the reason why I've written this book and, and uh, more broadly why I try to live the life that I lead um, is that all of life is in those in those gray areas. And if we can't find a way to to communicate with each other and share ideas and try to find a common way forward, there are going to be a lot of problems. And when we're talking about the future of life on earth, like that's a big, big deal. And we should at least try to be inclusive. Well, you know, you, you mentioned just now the, the way you live your life. Uh, you're very, you live a very, uh, by many standard scripts of how people should live life. You've had an unusual path. Like someone might say, oh, you just wrote a book completely about genetic hacking, um, but you're not a medical doctor or a biologist or scientific researcher. Um, and I, by the way, I approve. I think yeah. the way we label things and put people in their little um, kind of very tiny and crowded lanes is uh, 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 bad for society, bad, bad for science, bad for the arts and, and a, a host of things. So you, I feel like you've done, you've gone an interesting route, but you've done everything from like run for Congress to you worked for the Clinton administration. 
you've got a PhD in what, like Asian studies? Asian history, yeah. So, and and you you then my dream come true. You've written a bunch of science fiction novels, right. uh, the Genesis Code, right, and, and, uh, and Eternal, Eternal Sonata. Sonata, and uh, they were well received. Uh, first, first off, I'm fascinated by that. Why not become just like the best science fiction novelist you could be? Like, did you sort of lose interest? No, or? no, 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 not at all. On the, on the, the contrary. Um, so let me give you just a little bit of background of how I how I got here, if you don't mind. When I started writing, I started when I recognized 23, 24 years ago that this was this genetics and biotech revolutions were such a big deal. The first thing I did was I educated myself, uh, and so I just read everything that I could possibly find. I interrogated all the scientists who I could find. Such to the point that now I give regularly keynotes to conventions of hundreds or thousands of doctors and scientists. And so um, at least they believe that I've, I've, got, um, I've got something to say. And then I started writing articles, policy articles in journals like Foreign Affairs and Foreign Policy that are kind of boring specialist things. And then a member of Congress, Brad Sherman from LA, um, called me and said, I read one of your articles. This is so important. Nobody is talking about this. Um, I'd like to organize a hearing around your article. Can you recommend other witnesses and come and be the lead witness, which I did. And then I was talking more. I felt like I wasn't communicating. I wasn't reaching as wide an audience as I wanted to. So that was when I wrote these two near-term sci-fi novels to tell the story of the genetics revolution, but in a way that people could suspend their judgment. Because if I said, hey, the genetics revolution is coming, people say, oh, that sounds like science. That's afraid. Uh, that frightens me. Um, but if I say, hey, I have this great story and there's sex and violence and Mossad and, and all these other things, you know, people got excited and, and it kind of, they learned the science inadvertently. But then this crazy thing happened that when I was on my book tours for the novels and when I explained the science in the way that a self-taught person and a novelist would talk about science, not the way the scientists talk about science in most cases, I could see people's eyes going wide because they had heard the words, but they didn't know the through line. They didn't know the story. And that was when I realized I needed to write the story, the real story of the genetics revolution, but do it in a way that people could easily absorb, the kind of book that people would want to read when they're laying by the pool or, or, or on the beach, and to have learning about something that's so important to all of our lives feel effortless rather than like going to the dentist. And, and it's so interesting because this happens in every area of science from, and I can see this from all the scientists that I've interviewed where right. we've, we've talked about this, any academic who writes, like, let's say a popular science book, or like in your case, you write a book explaining science to the layman is going to be hated by academics. And I always wonder about this. Is it because academics can't write? And so they don't, they, they don't like somebody who can write well to the masses. Do they, are they jealous of the money made by someone who writes a popular science book as opposed to uh, someone who just writes something for an obscure journal? Are they, do they not want the masses to know what's happening? I would think they would want the masses to know because that increases their status and importance if, if the masses think, that, oh, this is important. So what's, what's the issue that they have? You know, I don't know, but one of the areas that I find is that both for the scientists and the doctors, their whole training is to look at the problem exactly in front of you. If you're a scientist, the way it works is you, most of the scientists are solving one very narrow, specific problem problem. And the same thing if you're a doctor, like if you're a doctor and, and let's say you're an oncologist and someone comes with you with cancer, like these per people have cancer. They don't want to hear about what the genetics revolution will mean for our species over the coming decades and, and centuries. They really want you to focus all of your life's energies. And I was in, uh, two months ago, I was in Kyoto and I went to one of the world's leading stem cell labs and I, I had a lunch with all of the top postdocs. So these are guys who really at the, at the height of their knowledge and powers and working on really revolutionary work of basically how to make an unlimited number of eggs out of using stem cells. So basically you could take an adult By the cell. way, this was a fascinating part yes. of your book. Yeah. Not that talk, but that idea. Yes, and we'll get, maybe we'll come back to it. And so what I said to these guys, guys in the lunch, I said, I have two questions for you. First, tell me what you're doing now. And, and people were so animated, they could answer it, and they were just, you could just see it on their faces. And then the second question, tell me what are the implications of the work you're doing now for 50 years from now? And the look of terror that came across these people's faces, because that wasn't just wasn't what they were doing. 
And so I think it's uncomfortable, like um, for like I, yesterday, I gave a talk um, at this really incredible company um, that is using genetic and other tools um, to address uh, single gene mutation diseases. They're called rare and orphan um, uh, diseases. And I was saying like the work that you guys are doing is unbelievable, that you're going to make these people who would otherwise die or live these lives of terrible suffering have much better lives. But you need to recognize that there are, that where this technology is going, this isn't just about healthcare. I mean, the genetics revolution is going to go way, way, way beyond healthcare. This is about our future as a species. This is about our identity. And, right, because, and, because, yeah. and, 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 sorry to interrupt, no, but, please. Uh, because sort of the point, it's sort of like this, this study of the future of gene editing is kind of in the present and near future, it's about healthcare. It's about eradicating yeah. first these uh, single mutation diseases, right. then these more omni-genetic right. diseases. But then when you start to go from gene editing to gene writing, it's like, oh, I could suddenly pick all the features of my life that I want to be. Yeah, well, the way, the way I, I describe it is that healthcare is a station along the way of the genetics revolution. It's not the destination. The destination is evolution. And that's the thing. And so if you're somebody who's working on the healthcare applications, which is wonderful, and those are the most meaningful applications now, like it's difficult to think, well, where this is going is that we are going to be a very different species 100, 500, 1,000 years from now because of these technologies. And it's all, it's all connected. And, and that's the thing. So that uh, what I talk about, there are these three stages. And certainly the first and, and most important is healthcare. And then the second is uh, direct-to-consumer genetics. People are going to have all kinds of information about themselves and their children. And we're going to have to think about how, how do we parent? How do we think about identity? When, when these, these attributes that we once thought as fate and magic and, and whatever else are more known to us. And then the third, kind of the killer application for these technologies is in assisted reproduction. And that's why we're going to move away from conception through sex. We'll have sex for all the great reasons, but I think we're coming to the end of an era where humans conceived of their children through sex. Right, because when people do it the old, uh, when you sort of imply when people do it the old-fashioned way, sex, there's too much uh, opportunity for mistakes to be made in the genetics, as opposed to directly kind of writing the genes of the child you're going to have. Yeah, so so there is a like there's a level of risk that's baked into our biology, and the reason is because we're all different, and so everybody is a mutant in one way or another. And then some of us have mutations that are actually really helpful, and some of us have mutations that are really harmful. And that's just the role of the dice of being a sexually reproducing species like ours. And so the question, uh, a lot of people are afraid of using science so aggressively, but the question is, can we do better than the error rate of natural birth. And right now, about 3% of all children are born with some kind of harmful genetic abnormality. So that's the bar. And once we can use a process of, of in vitro fertilization, IVF, and embryo screening to reduce that 3% to 2% to 1%, that's kind of the entry level. But once we take conception outside of the human body, then these early stage pre-implanted embryos are available for the application of science. And so the first one will be um, extracting cells and sequencing them. So we'll be able to select among embryos. And then the second phase uh, will be to create many more eggs using what's called in vitro gametogenesis, which basically means you take any kind of adult cell, but like a skin graft and turn those skin cells into stem cells, stem cells into egg precursor cells, egg precursor cells into eggs. And in that case, you could have a million, let's say it's 100,000 eggs that are fertilized with the male sperm. So you have real choice. And then on top of that, then there is the application of gene editing tools like CRISPR, but better than CRISPR, um, that will allow us to make at least a, a small number of written gene edits to our future children. Eric Weinstein, I think the best word to describe, like if you sit in a room with him for even two minutes, you'll say to yourself, oh my God, this guy is smart. And I was intimidated. I felt like, how am I, is he going to think I'm stupid? Like what, what's going to happen? 
So he's the managing director of Teal Capital. I don't know if you remember, Peter, Peter Teal was on my podcast back in 2014. Eric was, and this is after my own heart, he was a college dropout, but then he went back, got a PhD from Harvard in mathematical physics. Uh, again, such a, such a smart guy. I know him from several different places. One is because I knew Peter Thiel. The other is I've been reading his writings and his opinions on, on free speech and the economy. In this clip, Eric talks about how he learned to think clearly because too many of us are in a fog. Like I feel often I'm so much thinking about my stresses and what are, what am I, what do I have to do today? Who, who do I have to talk to? What am I going to say? But how do you just clear your mind so you could be creative, have energy, be an innovator, make new discoveries? How do you do it? Let's hear Eric explain. In many ways, permission to be an imposter is something you have to take for yourself. So if you're hearing this podcast and if you feel like an imposter, instead of trying to fight it, uh, just try experimenting when you're in, in the quiet of your own room. What, what, what if I am an imposter? Then so what? Um, maybe the idea is that my faking it would be as good or better than somebody else's uh, earnest attempts. So, you know, I have a friend who... Um, you know, taught herself forms of dance that um, she didn't have any formal training in, but it looked, certainly looked like she knew what she was doing. But anybody who was actually trained in those forms of dance would know it was uh, it was just completely made up. So I, I think it's very appealing to stop fighting your fear of being an imposter and say that's no excuse for for staying on the couch. You know, it's uh, you know. For any area, it seems like there's a set path, there's a set formula to become the top of that area, to succeed in that area. Politics was one example. You needed, to, you know, you supposedly needed to be in the House and the Senate and maybe a governor, then vice president, then a president. That was considered the typical path. And with some variation, that's the path that many politicians have followed. Um, with mathematics, you, you go to graduate school, you get a PhD, you become a professor, and now you're a mathematician. And I think, would you say being an imposter is when, and, and this happens in every area, there are people who come into the area without taking that traditional path. Donald right, Trump, yeah. of course, became president without taking the traditional path. I'm sure there's mathematicians who have not, don't even have a PhD, but have discovered some solution to some theorem or whatever. The guy who came up with Green's functions, which is a way of inverting a differential operator, if you will, um, I think it was a miller in the middle of England, and he sent off a solution to Cambridge uh, to some famous problem. And they wanted to appoint him to a professorship. And then he said, well, really, I, I didn't even go to college. And so they forced him to get a BA before they could make him a professor. Which That's is, fascinating. How, so was he just reading like math papers all his life? Or I think what? it was kind of unclear. But yeah. you, you know, never, um, never discount what somebody can do completely on their own. If you think just like about Jimi Hendrix's strange stringing of his guitar, a right-handed guitar played upside down and backwards as a left-hander, it immediately took him out of an ability to like watch what somebody else was doing and just copy it because it was so different. So in some sense, it's not that surprising that he would sound that unique because nobody else was even in his same universality class or you know Stanley Jordan tunes the guitar i think in uniformly in fourths which is a very uncommon thing to do and so it puts you in a in, a, in a, just a different class and so, i think when when you when you first make a decision to uh, to burn the boats so there's no there's no returning home right I mean, like this is what the people did when they, the mutiny on the bounty when they hit right. Karen island that they they burned the bounty so nobody could leave um I think that that's when things get really exciting because it's sink or swim and people become incredibly inventive once they become isolated and terrified. Chase Jarvis is one of the best photographers in the world. I remember about three years ago, I asked him for advice. How can I be a better photographer? And he gave me really good advice that I've been using ever since, but for several months afterwards, I would take a photograph every day based on his advice to try to improve. 
So a couple of things. He's the founder of Creative Live, which is the world's largest online learning platform for creatives and entrepreneurs. I've watched many of his videos. I've been on Creative Live, actually. And now he's the author of a new book, Creative Calling, Establish a Daily Practice, Infuse Your World with Meaning, and Succeed in Work and Life. This book is the Bible of creativity. In this clip, I asked Chase, how do you start when it's been so long since your last reinvention? Because so many people struggle to start over or, or struggle to give them themselves even permission to start over. This is something I am constantly wrestling with. Here's Chase's answer from episode 491. We're all creative. Wildly. So the first principle is everyone's creative. We all have it natively. It's our birthright. It's what separates us from every other species on the planet. Thing two, that it's a muscle. It's a habit. It's a process, not a product. And that by you know the, the developing a muscle, the way you do that is through using it and acknowledging it, right? You, when you go to the gym, like, okay, cool. I'm going to spend some time working on my, uh, my physicality, which is an important part. Or if you get in a bike accident, like I need to spend some time and recover. So acknowledging that creativity is a process, that it's a muscle and it needs strengthening. The third principle, assuming you buy one and two is, and to me, this is the, this is the aha is that by creating in small ways every day, by having a habit and just acknowledging it does not have to mean you move to Paris, start smoking cigarettes and, and, and wear the beret and get the new friends and all these things that are very creative. No, just by creating in small ways every day, building a business, making a meal, baking a cake, um, how you express yourself. It's in those small exercises every day that you actually realize that you have agency to create your life. They're the same muscles, the same muscles yeah. that you use to write in the morning, to practice stand-up comedy. Those are the same exact muscles that you use to create the arc of your life. And to me, this was, this was my like 20 year synthesis of, oh my God, what creating in small ways, it helps me understand that I have agency in creating the biggest things, whether it's a book that takes many years to write or ultimately your life. So to me, the, like, those three principles, and you know, we can dive into. There's plenty to un uncork. Yeah, yeah. In each of oh, those things, me. of course, we're but, going to unpack. <laughs> but uh, it just to me that those are um, those are things that you could understand. You know, after I mentioned them, you could stand back and like, yeah, that makes sense. But why are these like? Why isn't that not a central concept in our culture to value and appreciate creativity? In fact, it's just the opposite. We're sold this narrative that some people are creatives and some people aren't, that creativity is a nice to have. It's kind of like a, oh, oh, he's so creative. And it's sort of put in air quotes. And But the reality is, not, as, not only is creativity not naive, not only is creativity not just a nice to have, this is as fundamental as nutrition, as exercise. It is literally the building, like it's, it's the muscle that can allow us to do everything. So, so why do you think it's not... Um, you know, appreciated in our culture the way you just described? Because I think creativity was early on in culture was associated specifically and only with art. Art equaled creativity. What we understand now is that all these other processes, building a business, uh, again, raising a family, these are all aspects where if you if you subscribe to the definition of creativity that I put forward in the book, which is just you're combining two things that used to not be together. You're putting them together in a way that's new and useful. I think it's important to realize, you know, what what is the reason you're making, what are the reasons you're making a certain decision? You're going down a certain path and you need that that flame a little bit, you know. Not even a little bit. I think it's one of the most important things in our culture. And sadly to me, and one of the reasons I needed to write the book was because we need to acknowledge that but I'm always wondering, like, let's say someone's listening to this. They're 40, 50, 60 years old. They want to, they, they've kind of maybe for whatever reason, good or bad, blocked out or not listened to that inner flame yeah. or that, that compass. Yeah. How do you, how do you start to listen to it when, when it's been so long? Right. First of all, you're not alone. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that you need to know is that there are more people that are like you than are not like you that deny this part of themselves or that, uh, issued it because it was not practical. And I'm here to tell you that creativity is the most practical lever that you have in your life. Again, it can it can unlock 
um, areas of life that you didn't know or existed. It can help personally like, transform you. To me, creativity is so fundamental. It's as fundamental as exercise or nutrition, right? And we're creating machines. And by not even acknowledging that you are creative and that you have agency over what you do and don't do and how you spend your time or don't spend your time, you you sort of cram down and ignore that beautiful sixth grade or that sorry first grade six year old self that said I want to come up to the front of that room and draw a picture, and it's not just that you suppress it and nothing happens. That sort of eats away at you. It's because we're fundamentally human creating machines. So by telling people that they're not alone, this is a is this is a lie that you were sold a long time ago when it wasn't convenient for culture. It was inconvenient for it to have a bunch of wildly creative. Uh, people who question the status quo, and so we had we we had a school system, we had an employment system that were different. It's fine. I'm just here to say that now, even though you're not alone, now is the right time. And it, this does not mean giving up. You know, you have to move into a different house or move to Paris or get a new set of friends. That is the wrong vision that you have of creativity. What creativity means is acknowledging that you're a creator. And that you can put two more things together to form something that's new, new and useful. And reality says you do it every single day. You're just not acknowledging it. So the first thing I want you to do is to call yourself a creator. Words matter. And if you understand that you say, oh, I'm not really all that creative, that's fine. Maybe you think of yourself as a math head. But just so you know, math is wildly creative. Wildly creative. Science, all science is like the wheel is mechanical engineering plus creativity. Like we've just been fed a definition that creativity equals painting and that's not the case. So one, when you start thinking of yourself as this infinite creative superpower, you've got this little core of creative plutonium in you and you just really haven't used that. What's cool is the, this is the one resource. This is a ripoff of a Maya Angelou quote where the more you use, the more you get. It's not something that's depleted. It's something that's empowered. And if you can start to think about that, it doesn't matter if you're 18, 35, 55 or 95. Like acknowledging and putting that creative muscle to work is is becomes effective today. The first time you do it a second time, you've seen a benefit from creativity, even if you took a step backwards, because you're exercising the muscle that ultimately will shape your life. So 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 you know, and this goes along with what you're what you say throughout the book, which is daily, and you really cement this at the end, but daily creativity, doing something that you consider creative, more creative than your normal output, doing something every single day that's creative. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so... How do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.